So quick, very quick review here, the difference between fission and fusion in terms of you know, the structure of what happens. In fission, generally speaking, you have a large nucleus which you poke usually with a neutron that's moving at just the right speed and that upsets the balance of nucleons and the intermediate nucleus that has that original nucleus plus that extra neutron is incredibly unstable. It fragments or fizzes if you like, into smaller nuclei. Usually two smaller nuclei, smaller than the nucleus you started off with. And you always get, always, no matter which fissionable material you do this with, you get extra neutrons being kicked out. And that can trigger more of the nuclei to undergo fission. Whereas fusion involves smaller nuclei coming together to form a larger nucleus. Uh, in terms of reactors and using this for production of electrical energy, fission reactors are very abundant right now. We use them quite a lot over the surface of the earth, but we don't have any working fusion reactors. We've got fission reactors that are working, but not fusion. Uh, products for fission are radioactive. By products, I mean the stuff that we're left over with. And the best solution for storing that stuff is to put it in lead-lined barrels filled with concrete, no word of a lie, dump them in the ocean. So they sink to the ocean floor. Uh, when you're talking about some of these radioactive products, like the krypton and the barium that we talked about yesterday, the half-life could be millions of years, which means it's going to be ticking away for a very long time. However, the products of nuclear fusion are generally speaking clean. The disadvantage, another disadvantage to fission is that the fuel is limited, whereas the fuel is very abundant, which means it's easy to get the fuel for fusion. However, there are some similarities. They both involve a loss of mass and therefore a release of energy, and that means that the binding energy per nucleon increases. And I will talk a little bit later about that today. But and if you need your textbook, you can get it later. I should have put that up earlier. But let's go to the questions first of all. Does anybody have any questions you would like me to go over here? Yeah. Three? Three? Yeah. So... It says use the appendix of nuclear masses in your textbook. That's that page 881 table that I've told you about. Uh, I've got a copy up here that we'll look at. And again, that wouldn't be how the question would be on an exam. It would be masses would be given to you. But I do want to walk through this one. We have uranium-235. So let's first of all, well, let me back up. If you're going to use this table of masses to determine the energy produced in what's happening in number three, then you need to know everything about what's happening in number three. Meaning, you need to know all of the pieces you start off with and all of the pieces you end up with. So let's make sure we get that straightened out in our head first. What are we told here? We're told uranium-235 absorbs a neutron. Okay, well let's write this out. Uranium-235, I'm pretty sure that's 92, but you can double check on your periodic table, good. It absorbs a neutron. Well, we're expected to know that the isotope, well, it's not even isotope notation, but the notation we use for a neutron is one zero. The zero means there's no charge on the neutron. The one means there's one nucleon. And if there's no charge, that means there's no protons, which means that nucleon is a neutron. You follow that? Okay. Um, we don't have to write this little bit of business here, but... I could if I wanted to. This is what we get. Okay, this is the result of putting that neutron into the nucleus. But that is unstable. And we produce bromine 87, Br87. And I'm going to have to look up the atomic number of bromine. It is uh, second last column from the right, three down after fluorine and chlorine. And bromine is 35. And what else do we produce? Lanthium-146. We went on a little treasure hunt for lanthium yesterday, and it is 57, I believe. 
And we know there are going to be neutrons, or, or I shouldn't say no. We suspect there's going to be neutrons because this is an example of a fission reaction. The question is, are we positive we're going to have neutrons? Well, if you add up the charges on the right so far, 35 and 57 gives you 92. And we have a charge on the left of 92, which means that if we have anything left, it has no charge. When we take a look at the top numbers, we've got 236 in total. And when I add these together, can you confirm that you get 233? Okay. That means that we have to have three nucleons in addition to everything we've already written. Now, you're not going to do this. Don't do this, because that isn't a thing. Three neutrons don't bond together to form something. What we're going to have to write is three neutrons. And now we're ready to go to the table. Now we're ready to take all of the masses on the right and subtract all of the masses on the left. We're going to have to be dealing with a lot of conversions here because when you take a look on this table, at the mass of the neutron, it's given in kilograms. Whereas the mass of the bromine 87 and the mass of the lanthium 146 are given in atomic mass units. So keep something in mind here, Ian and everybody. After we're done taking the final mass minus the initial mass, if we want to find the energy, we have to multiply by the speed of light squared, right? But that only works if you're in kilograms. So I don't see any use well, not use, it's the wrong word. It doesn't make sense to me to convert the mass of the neutron to atomic mass units, then work all in atomic mass units, and then convert the whole thing to kilograms. That may be your preference. I would prefer, and you have the equation in front of you, I would prefer to take the bromine mass in atomic mass units, which is 86.920711 and add the mass of the lanthium 146 in atomic mass units, which is 145.925791. And I want to double check both of those I forgot to add here. So the lanthium is 145.925791. The bromine is 86.920711. And now what I'm going to do is convert that to kilograms. And then I'm going to add three neutron masses in kilograms. Okay. So one atomic mass unit is 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27, so I'm multiplying by that conversion factor. This is the kilogram masses, bless you, of the bromine and the lanthium. But when you look at the reaction that we've written, we also have on the right-hand side three neutron masses. So I have to go plus three times, and this number down here is one you've probably seen before, 1.6749 times 10 to the negative 27, which would be given to you. So I need to add three times this number. And this is the mass we have to begin with. You okay with that? Or afterwards? Okay. Now how you manage these numbers is up to you because we still have to take the mass of a neutron which is in kilograms and add the mass of the uranium 235. Is it 235? Okay which is in atomic mass units. So I would be tempted to simply do this, minus in brackets. I'm going to take that neutron mass, which is on the left-hand side, of 1.6749 times 10 to the negative 27, and add the mass of the uranium 235, which is 235.043930. If 
but that's in atomic mass units. So I need to multiply that by 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27, just that number. Not the mass of the neutron, just that number. And then before I hit enter, I'm going to double check everything. I've got the mass of the neutron plus 235.043930 U's, atomic mass units, times the conversion number. So this is the mass change in the system. And whenever you have a mass change that's negative, that means the mass of the system has less afterwards than it was to begin with. So we have lost mass, which means we have lost energy, and that means the energy goes out somewhere. Where does it go? Into the environment. It goes into moving those neutrons, and it goes into maybe some molecular motion of the surrounding environment, but there's energy released. Uh, I didn't actually read the whole question. Ian, did this question actually say find the energy released? Okay. So now I need to multiply by the speed of light squared. And I get a negative amount of energy change, which means it's exothermic. And, and when you take Chemistry 30 next semester, Ian, you will, that will be drilled into your head, that if you have a negative delta H, they use H for energy over there. If you have a negative delta H, then it's exothermic. So I'm getting 2.68 times 10 to the negative 11 joules. And if you wanted to convert that to EV, I think you're fine with that. Okay. The answer is an EV? One point, uh, what do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six. Wow, 168 million EV. You know, and I would say to you, I, I don't, I think what's important here is you understand the principle of a change in mass producing a change in energy. And I don't think you would ever see on an exam a situation where you had to work with atomic mass units and kilograms in the same situation. It would probably be masses given to you all in kilograms or all in atomic mass units. But is that okay, Ian? Okay. Any other questions? All right, so we have uh, one more kind of topic to go, which I split into two uh, lessons, but I want us to go back to page 47 and just spend maybe five, ten minutes talking about artificial transmutation. <clears throat> when I told you about me going in and getting injected with a radioactive substance, uh, the isotope was technetium. I don't even know where technetium is on the periodic table. Technetium 99M. I'll talk about the M in a second. There it is, 43. Um, technetium 99M is an isotope of technetium that's radioactive. I don't know if you remember, but it has a half-life of about six hours. I don't know what the M is. There's, there's a slight variation between some technetium 99s and other technetium 99s. Or maybe the M stands for medical. I'm, I'm not sure. But I think you might recall that on the morning of this procedure, I got at least two phone calls uh, from the U of A and from the clinic that was doing it confirming that I would be coming in. And they, they really wanted to make sure, are you going to be there? Are you going to be there? Because it's an expensive procedure. And they have to manufacture this material. It needs to be manufactured because it's not naturally occurring. It's not naturally occurring because it has a half-life of six hours. So if there was some technetium-99 with a half-life of six hours that happened to be formed in geological processes when the Earth was formed or when the universe was formed, it would no longer be technetium-99M because every six hours, half of it goes away. So at the Slowpoke nuclear reactor at the U of A, uh, they have a different... Uh, reactor going there now, but at the Slowpoke nuclear reactor, they were manufacturing this stuff. You know, and it has to be timed right. They can't even manufacture it yesterday for a procedure today. They have to manufacture it like right then, send a courier over to the clinic where they're going to use it. And they do this with what's called artificial transmutation. So in artificial transmutation, you accelerate nuclei into other nuclei or other 
subatomic particles. Uh, in this case, it's an alpha particle or a helium nucleus colliding with a nitrogen-14 nucleus. And as I said, I have a, a friend that I went to school with, and he's a nuclear physicist, and when he explains this to children and would even be high school students, he says the same thing. What I do is I smash apples and oranges together and get grapes and bananas. You're, you're literally turning one element into another. I don't know if any of you have heard of the word alchemy. Alchemists? Long time ago, hundreds of years ago, gold is obviously very valuable. Lead is a cheap metal. It's also very toxic, but it's not valuable at all because it's a filthy metal. It gets all over your hands. It doesn't look shiny. So there was an attempt to convert lead into gold. And you can't do that with a chemical change because a chemical change just moves atoms around. You can do it with a nuclear change. You can turn lead into gold. You just have to do it one nucleus at a time. If you look at where lead is on the periodic table, uh, lead is number 82, gold is number 79. You would just have to find a nuclear process that would remove three protons from every gold nucleus. And you can do it, but it's atom at a time. Okay. What you basically happens here is you have a particle accelerator which collides two different nuclei together and you get some products. You, there's no way for you to predict what the products are going to be here. There literally is no way. If I told you that instead you produced two hydrogen one nuclei and what would that be? Nitrogen, and that, which would be kind of interesting, that you just ended up changing the nitrogen-14 to nitrogen-16 and getting a couple of hydrogen nuclei. You wouldn't know the difference on an exam. You would be told what the products are going to be. And it may be, I don't have the knowledge in my head, it may be that what you get depends on how fast these things are moving when they smack into each other. Okay. It may have something to do with the temperature. I don't know. It's probably a complicated procedure. But that is an example of artificial transmutation. The thing I want us to focus on is the fact that fission and fusion and radioactive decay are always exothermic. So that means the mass goes down. It's possible that the mass goes up, in which case it's endothermic. If you have an exothermic process, then you end up with something that is more stable than what you start off with. Just let that sink in. Something that is exothermic produces more stable products. Something that is endothermic is going to produce something unstable. A perfect example is that whatever they did to produce that technetium 99M produced something which was unstable, which would mean it was endothermic to produce it. I have some numbers here. Let's do some calculations. The mass of a nitrogen-14 atom is this number. The mass of this, by the way, is the alpha particle. I'll just put alpha here. Oh, there it is. I just didn't highlight it. Whereas what we produce is an oxygen-17 atom, and there's the mass in atomic mass units. And here is the mass of a hydrogen-1. This is just a proton. Um, I would like you to find the change in mass. I would like you to add the two masses that we end up with and take away the two masses we start with. And you can just leave your answer in atomic mass units. Sorry, I guess I could have made that a little bigger.
Yeah. It's a positive number. It's a positive number, which means the final mass is more than the original mass, which means the mass went up, which means we've created mass. The nucleons are all conserved, the charge is all conserved, but their masses collectively are more afterwards. If I were to convert that to kilograms, nope. if I were to convert that to kilograms, the mass has gone up for one of these nitrogen-14 turning into the oxygen-17. The mass has gone up by that amount, which means this is the amount of energy in joules that you have to put in to make this happen. So the energy is going up in the system. You're, it's sucking energy out of the environment. And that's a significant amount of energy in electron volts. It just means for one nucleus, you need to jack in, what is that, 1.2 million electron volts? Am I reading that right? That's how much the energy needs to be pumped up just to get one nucleus to do this. And that's artificial transmutation. So you might see things on an exam where the mass goes up, and it's because it's an artificial process. It's like an endothermic chemical reaction. It's not going to happen unless you, in electrochemistry, you pass electricity through the cell to make it happen. Does anybody have any questions with artificial transmutation? Ian? Bill, you've added a, 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 an alpha particle. Will that sometimes make the product more stable? Or will you like always make it unstable? I'm, I'm not sure I want to address the alpha particle aspect. There's nothing significant about it being an alpha particle. I just want to get that out of the way. It could be instead nitrogen-14 colliding with a beryllium-6 nucleus. It could be all kinds of weird combinations. So there's nothing special about the alpha particle. And that's kind of why I said, let's just call this helium in our head. But your, your question is, could you bump things together and the result is more stability? Certainly. Um, if you think about it, fission is exactly what we're talking about, except that you're bumping things together that are not nuclei. One's a nucleus and one's a neutron. So it could be under the right circumstances that you choose two things to collide in artificial circumstances. They collide and then break apart into stuff that becomes more stable. And I would say that there's probably a sweet spot here for the amount of energy that you put in. That maybe if, you, if these things are moving too fast, when they collide, you just get a lot of stable material. So it's possible, yes. And, and you know, what I want to address then is the fact that artificial transmutation is not always endothermic. I, I would leave you with that. Could be exothermic. A lot of the time it's endothermic, but it could be exothermic. Remember, endothermic is what we just talked about. The mass goes up. The energy goes up. Any other questions? OK. We're going to move on now and take a look at the final lesson, which, as I said, is broken into two days. And I kind of mentioned right at the end of yesterday's class, I showed you something. Um, we're going to be learning a little bit about matter and antimatter today and looking at methods of detecting and classifying particles, uh, particles that may in fact be newly discovered particles. But it's leading tomorrow to something called the standard model of matter. And I've been teaching for 33 years, I think. This new curriculum that brought in the standard model of matter happened 15 years ago. So for a little over half of my teaching career, I, I didn't teach the standard model of matter, and I never studied it in university. And then when it came in, I decided that I would try to figure it out. I would try to really teach myself the standard model of matter. And I, I did some research, and I found what would be described as maybe the most basic textbook I could find on the standard model of matter, an introduction to it. And I didn't make it past page one. I, I really, the math was so complex 
Had I been back in university, maybe I would have been able to handle it. But the standard model of matter is something that is very, very mathematically complex. And I just want to start off by telling you that because throughout today and tomorrow, you're just going to be given little splashes of the standard model of matter. You're not going to, be, you're not going to come out of this understanding the entire picture. In fact, and this is what I, I showed you at the end of the class. Some of you may have seen it. Some of you may not have. This is called the Lagrangian formula. This is one formula. I know this is hard to believe, and it looks like I'm just having fun with you and making something up. This is a formula, and it just goes on and on. Now, that wasn't what was on page one of that textbook that I bought, which is still sitting at home gathering dust. But there was enough intimidating math that I didn't, and I, every now and then I pull it out and I go, okay, Paul, figure this out. And, and I can't. I, I just I don't have the math background. What I would say to you about this equation is it is an equation that explains all of the interactions of all of the different types of particles that we know of in the universe. And if you apply this equation to beta decay, it becomes something simpler. If you apply it to nuclear fission, it becomes something simpler. If you apply it to uh, proton decay into a, pos into, a, yeah, into a positron, it becomes something different. So keep that in mind as we work through this. It's, it's my way of telling you, you may have questions and feel free to ask them, but I may not be able to answer them. Okay? However, to begin with, in 1929, almost 100 years ago, a physicist by the name of Dirac hypothesized the existence of something called antimatter. And there's a reason for this, and some of us were talking the other day about this with nuclear physics and subnuclear physics. It, it came about because I think Carly had asked, why is there an antineutrino in beta decay? Remember, remember that? And, and I said, well, it turns out that if you didn't know about the antineutrino and you do an experiment and you don't, you only look at the particles that you know of, not the antineutrino, there's a violation of the law of conservation of momentum. So what physicists did is they invented a particle. They said, well, there must be some other particle that's accounting for the conservation of momentum. Let's call it an antineutrino. I don't know if they named it later or not. Anyway, then they go looking for it and they find it. And this is what happens a lot. So I, Dirac isn't you know, laying in the sun with his cocktail dreaming of science fiction. There are reasons why he comes up with this idea. And what antimatter is, is it's matter. I hate that it's called antimatter. It's matter. It's substance. But it has some opposite property to regular matter. Some opposite property. He hypothesized the existence of a positron to explain positron decay. And a positron is an anti-electron. So let's just review this. This is what we can write as a positron. It's really written this way whenever we make use of it in a nuclear equation. And it could be written this way or this way. It's a positive electron. So you're taught electrons are negative. Well, you know what? Not all electrons are negative. The ones that are positive, however, are not called electrons. They're called positrons. And we believe, we, see how I just sneak myself in with all the intellectuals there, we believe that for every type of particle there is in the universe that we would call regular matter, there is a type of particle called antimatter. I don't mean for every electron in the universe there's a positron somewhere. I'm just saying there are electrons, and that means we believe there are anti-electrons. So matter and antimatter, in this case, an electron and an anti-electron, those two particles are identical except for their charge. In the case of a proton and an antiproton, those two particles are identical except for their charge. So I had mentioned this before with electrons, but I'm going to do it with a proton and an antiproton. If you could hold a proton in your hand, in your left hand, and a, a, an antiproton in the right hand, and if you could describe them, like 
how squishy they are, how big they are, what color they are. All of these properties, by the way, are not really pertinent to these particles. They're too small. But what you would discover is they're identical in every way. You cannot tell the difference between them until you put the proton in an electric field and it moves one way, and you put the positron in electric or the antiproton in the same electric field and it moves the other way. So we have evidence that they have opposite charges. However, that breaks down a little bit because like a neutrino doesn't have a charge. So an antineutrino is the opposite particle, it's the antimatter particle of a neutrino, but they're not opposite in charge, they're opposite in something else which we call spin, but it doesn't matter. Um, a neutron and an antineutron are opposite, but a neutron has no charge, right? However, and I'll just let you in on the secret that we'll learn tomorrow, a neutron does have charge, it just has pieces of charge together that add up to zero. There's pieces in a neutron, and all three of those charges, there's going to be three of them, add up to zero. And if you were to look at all three of the pieces of an antineutron, you would discover all of their charges are opposite to all three of the other pieces of the neutron. So it is an antiparticle because it ha has a different charge. What happens when matter and antimatter meet is they annihilate each other. And annihilate doesn't mean obliterate or blast away or explode. It means they're gone. So if an electron is moving through space and it meets an anti-electron, they will disappear from the universe. This is an example of matter turning into energy. So if there was an anti-Mr. Way, I don't know how an anti-Mr. Way could stand in this room, but a Mr. Way made of all anti-particles, somehow hovering magically so it doesn't make contact with any matter, and I walk over and shake his hand, say goodbye. All of that matter is turned to energy. And it's turned to energy based on E equals mc squared. So, you know, if I were to estimate my mass, let's say one, 165 uh, divided by 2.2, let's just say 75 kilograms. If I multiply that by the speed of light squared, and I double it, because that's my mass and anti-Mr. Way's mass is the same thing, this is the amount of energy that would be created in the destruction of that matter-antimatter. Huge, huge amount of energy. And it's created in the form of gamma ray photons. This is more energy than any of those nuclear blasts we were talking about. Pretty sure. Pretty sure they were in the neighborhood of 10 to the 13 joules. So the first question is, if a positron and an electron collide, how much energy is produced, and what is the wavelength of the two photons that are produced? So this is something you need to know. You're not going to be told this. When a proton and electron collide, their matter is destroyed, and you get two photons produced. By the way, the reason you get two photons is because momentum has to be conserved. When a proton, sorry, when an electron and a positron come together, they're going to be pulled together with an electric force of attraction, so they're going to have a total momentum that adds to basically zero. One will have momentum to the left, one will have momentum to the right. If all you produced was one photon, a photon would only have momentum in one direction, so you get two photons that are produced. Basically, what we have to do is take the mass of these particles and convert them to energy, and if you take both masses and convert it to energy, then you've got to split that energy equally between the two photons. Or if you're wise, you can say that this positron produces one photon and the electron produces the other. However, uh, I'm going to choose to do the total mass. The total mass before is equal to, I'm even going to do this, mi is equal to 2 times 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. The final mass is equal to zero because the matter is destroyed. 
And that means that the change in the mass is equal to 0 minus this number. Can you tell me, please, is this number 2 times this, is it 1.822 times 10 to the negative 30 kilograms? It is. So we simply need to multiply that by the speed of light squared because delta E equals delta M C squared. And do you get this number? I just, I just need somebody to confirm. Okay. So 1.6398. And by the way, you get negative 1.6398 times 10 to the negative 13 joules. Which means whatever happened here is exothermic, you create energy. We create energy in the form of photons, and this energy is split equally between the two photons. So the fact that you get two photons, the fact that they're identical photons, is something you need to know. This is called matter-antimatter -matter annihilation. So on an exam, you might see during the matter-antimatter -matter annihilation of a proton and an antiproton, what is the energy of each photon? Here, it's the matter-antimatter -matter annihilation of two electron and of an electron and a positron. So if we divide that by two, each photon would have, well, I'm not going to put the negative in here, 8.199 times 10 to the negative 14 joules, and we can use E equals HC over lambda to find the wavelength. It, it's not, I don't think it's very wise here to use the 1242 thing because this energy is far beyond visible light. So if you divide 1242 by whatever that is in EV, you're going to get a number of nanometers that's quite small. The wavelength will be equal to HC over E. So we have to go back to the basics here and take the standard value of Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the answer. And it gives me 2.4 times 10 to the negative 12 meters, which is definitely gamma radiation. Remember, x-ray is about 10 to the negative 10. So gamma is even smaller, 10 to the negative 12, 10 to the negative 13. Any questions with that first example? Ian. You calculated that the, the, the change in energy was negative. How come each photon or each photon is not Well, when we talk about the energy that a photon has, it's an amount of energy. And that's why, and, and I think maybe you just missed it or I didn't stress it enough. That's why at some point I said, we're not going to use the negative anymore. We, the negative simply telling us that the energy was released. So it's that amount of energy that's released. It's that amount of energy which is divided by 2 to get for each photon. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, well, the opposite can happen. You can create matter from energy. And this is called pair production, and it's bolded because you're expected to know this. Under the right circumstances, and here's the difference between what we just did and what's up here, under the right circumstances, a single photon gets close to a nucleus, is absorbed by the nucleus, and you get matter and antimatter being produced. And the one we're going to look at is the photon's energy being converted to two particles. One is an electron and one is a positron. I guess what I'm telling you is if you see this phrase on an exam, Unless you're told otherwise, you're producing an electron and a positron. There are other types of pair production, but this is the one you need to know. So what's happening here 
Here's a before and after situation. That sphere, that large gray sphere is a nucleus. So before you have a photon and the photon is absorbed by the nucleus and these particles don't come from the nucleus, they're just born into existence. They're just all of a sudden there. This time you have the energy of one photon creating the mass of two particles. The question is, what is the frequency of the photon needed to make this happen? And I'm going to address why it says minimum frequency a little bit later. But basically, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't this 1.822 times 10 to the negative 30 kilograms? that was lost in the previous question? Well, that means in this question, that is the amount of matter that's created, which means we can set that times the speed of light squared to get the energy of the photon. So this time, whatever that energy is, it's one photon. Uh, 1.822 multiplied by 10 to the negative 30 times the speed of light squared. So this energy, in the last question, we said, well, that's the total mass that was destroyed, and we get two photons, so let's divvy up that energy between the two photons. Here, all of that mass is created because of one photon. This is the energy of that photon. 1.6398 times 10 to the negative 13 joules. And if we want to find the frequency, you should know from the previous unit, HF is the energy of a photon. We can divide that by Planck's constant and get the frequency. Whoops. So 2.4 times 10 to the 20 hertz. Why is that the minimum frequency? Well, does anybody know? If it's less than that, you cannot, this will never happen. If it's more than that frequency, it can happen. It can still happen. Why? Because if it's more than this energy, this is the energy equivalent of this mass. So if it's more than this energy, you're not going to get more mass created because those particles have definable masses. What's going to happen if the frequency of the photon is even greater? Yeah? It just happens faster? No, although it might. But speed has something to do with it. The particles themselves, the electron and the positron, are probably going to be moving faster. They'll have, in other words, more kinetic energy. Yeah. And, you know, if it were this exact frequency, then these two particles would be born into existence without motion, and what would happen is they would collide, because they're attracted to each other, and you'd have matter-antimatter annihilation, and you get those two photons we talked about earlier. By the way, the vast majority of, sus of stuff in our universe is matter. Matter won the war in the creation of the universe. There's not too much antimatter out there. So this positron that's created in this process is very short-lived because it's bound to run into an electron somewhere else. Any questions with that example? All right, I want to talk to you now about just in general the concept of converting matter to energy. Example 3 says the annual energy usage of North America is about 3 times 10 to the 90 
19 joules, which is a vast amount of energy. Forget about fusion, forget about fission. What if we had a, manter, a matter antimatter reactor? We could just, you know, you got a jug of matter and a jug of antimatter, and you pour them into two separate containers, and there's a process that slowly feeds some of the matter and the antimatter together. All that energy in the form of photons is used to heat water to steam, which turns a turbine. Boom. How much matter, how much mass, I shouldn't say matter, how much mass would we need to convert to energy every year to accomplish this? Well, delta E equals delta M C squared. If we want 3 times 10 to the 19 joules, all we have to do is take that 3 times 10 to the 19 joules mathematically and divide it by the square of the speed of light, and you are going to get 3.3 times 10 to the 2, I think. 333.3 kilograms. That's it. That's not even the mass of a vehicle. Right? You need 150 kilograms of matter and a half to 150 kilograms of antimatter. This is a pipe dream, of course, because we don't have antimatter floating around that we can just collect. Okay? It's very, very rare in the universe. Any questions with example three? All right. All right. Now what we're going to talk about is getting into more of the standard model of matter. Um, and you'll have a few questions from your textbook to read through and try to answer for tomorrow. When I was a child, if I got something that did something interesting, I wanted to know how it worked. I, I remember getting a... a a car, it had a battery in it, but you operated it, you had this, this thing you held, and when you squeezed it, it pushed air through a tube into the car. And if you squeezed it a certain amount, the car would go forward. If you squeezed it a different amount, it would go backwards. If you squeezed it a different amount, it would go forward and turn left. Like, it was weird. It was by pushing air in, and I wanted to know how it worked. So naturally, it ended up in pieces. Right? That's what would typically happen with a lot of the toys I had. I would break them apart to see what was inside of them. And that's kind of what's going on when we talk about discovering new particles or finding out what things are made of at the nuclear level. In order to discover these new particles, you have to smash them together with tremendous amounts of energy because strong nuclear forces are holding these particles together. So, for example, if you're interested in is a proton fundamental? Does a proton have no pieces to it, or does a proton have pieces to it? You've got to smack that proton really, really hard because there are nuclear forces involved. And in order to do that, you use what's called a particle accelerator. And I'm sure you have heard of particle accelerators. We've talked about them. There are two types of particle accelerators that you need to be Vaguely familiar with the structure of, but the physics is physics you already know. Because particle accelerators use electric and magnetic fields. One of them is called a cyclotron, one of them is called a synchrotron. When we're talking about the energy that these particles are given to smash together, it used to be in the millions, then it was in the billions, and now it's in the trillions of electron volts. And that's what a tera electron volt is, is a trillion electron volts. What a cyclotron does, and I don't want to spend too much time with this, but I feel the need to explain it to you, is you inject protons from this plate moving in this direction. So there's a proton that's injected in here or any charged particle, but I'm going to go with a proton. And at the moment of injection, when it enters right here, this plate on the top left is positive, and this disc or plate on the bottom right is negative. 
So that electron goes for an accelerated journey, a very short distance, but it speeds up. And then these two charges are removed and there is a magnetic field. And the magnetic field is causing the proton to curve to its right. And since the proton is moving in this direction, the magnetic field in this diagram must be out. It's not important. But there's a magnetic field out of the paper here forcing the particle in that direction. So it travels in a circular path where the same proton goes across here. But at that instant in time, the charge on the plates is turned back on and it's reversed, which means the proton is given another kick. It's accelerated again to a higher speed, which explains why it travels in a bigger radius. And then when the proton emerges here, the plates are switched again. I'm running out of colors here and that's where I'm going to kind of end it. So it's going to accelerate across here where it will travel in an even bigger radius. And it may go through a series of hundreds or thousands of kicks along the way until finally it's spit out here. I'm not sure why this arrow is here. Finally it's spit out here and it's got a lot of energy. So if you have two of these together, you can point them at each other and smash the protons together and see what happens. Okay? These things are very small. This is physically about that big, this cyclotron. So it could fit on a table in this room. There's obviously some electrodes that go in. You can see there's some coils here probably that are producing magnetic fields. But that's one way that you can do it. There's a slightly larger one, but it's still pretty small. You can see some stairs on the left here, which you can judge the height of this thing by. Um, I don't know who this gentleman is. Uh, this is at a museum in France. This is obviously some kind of historical cyclotron. That's one way that you can do it. And you need to be able to apply the physics of magnetic and electric fields to that. When I say the protons are accelerated in a circle, you can use centripetal motion and magnetic forces. When I say that the protons are given an acceleration across the gap, you can use the voltage across the gap to predict the speed. Are, are you with me on this in general? We're not going to do a bunch of questions with this. You already have the physics. A synchrotron uses same basic ideas of electricity and magnetism except the particles to be accelerated are injected here and they are accelerated by a large voltage to this point where a magnetic field turns their direction where they are accelerated again, where a magnetic field turns their direction where they are accelerated again. It doesn't actually travel in a nice circle. It travels in like a polygon with a bunch of sides. There may be thousands or hundreds of thousands of these kicks. And the reason why this is more efficient is because of the scale of it. You can get more energy out of it because this is huge. This, this thing is massive. This is a particle accelerator in France. You can see down in the bottom of, not quite the bottom, well in the bottom right you can see some vehicles there you get an idea for the scale of this thing. It's huge. The Large Hadron Collider, I'm sure many of you have heard of that. Yes, the Large Hadron Collider, I think has a diameter of 25 kilometers. And it's built underground. Okay. You can do some research on it. And these beasts are able to get up into the tera electron volts. 10, 20, 30 tera electron volts. And the reason why physicists want to build things like this is so they can keep smashing things together more and more to find out if they're smaller and smaller pieces. It's why we know that a neutron has parts and why we know that a proton has parts. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow. What, does anybody know the names of those parts? Kaylee? Quarks. So it turns out a proton has three quarks in it, 
and a neutron has three quarks in it. They're different kinds of quarks that we'll talk about. An electron, we just, we haven't been able to smack an electron into pieces. We really believe, again, the collective we, an electron is fundamental. There's no parts to an electron. So we have those two ways to smash particles apart. But if you want to use science to discover new particles, you have to consider something else. These things are invisible. They're microscopic. They're microscopic microscopic. You, they're so tiny that we can't see them. So we need a way to detect them. All right. We need a way to detect them. And we use what's called a cloud chamber or a bubble chamber. And at the beginning of tomorrow's class, I think, is when I will show you some videos of these. Cloud chambers and bubble chambers only detect charged particles, first of all. Charged particles can ionize their surroundings. Okay? So can other particles, but charged particles can ionize their surroundings. What a cloud chamber is, is a container that contains a liquid that's been vaporized, say alcohol, methanol or ethanol, and it's in a cloud form. It's been vaporized, so it's a gas. We would normally have it a liquid at room temperature, but you've vaporized it somehow. The other thing that's important, though, is the temperature of that cloud is very, very low. And when you go from gas to liquid, you go to a lower temperature. So this gas in the cloud chamber, whatever it's made of, is very close to the, what you can call the dew point or the liquefaction point. It's very close to the temperature at which it would turn into a liquid. And I don't know if any of you have ever, ever seen this, but if you take a bottle of something, beer seems to work good, and you put it in the freezer, and you leave it in there for just the right amount of time, and it's really, really cold, but it's still liquid. When you open it up, it freezes. Right? And the idea here is when something is at kind of a critical point between two phases, if you just knock the molecules around a bit, it makes that phase change. So you have this cloud that is almost a liquid, and when a charged particle goes zipping through, it, it leaves a trail. It leaves a trail of liquid. It turns all of the cloud into actual liquid in its path. And you see a line. You never see the particle, but you see its trail. It's called a vapor trail. Well, it's actually called a liquid trail in that case. What a bubble chamber is, is a container that's got liquid in it, but it's at a high temperature, almost in gaseous form. And when a charged particle goes through it, it upsets the molecular structure of the liquid, which is almost a gas, producing a line of bubbles. But, you know, if you couldn't see the liquid or the gas in the bubble or the cloud chambers, you would see no difference between the tracks. You see a line of white. And it's either a line of liquid in a gas or it's a line of gas in a liquid. Those are the two devices we use. And what you see, this is actually a picture from a bubble chamber or a cloud chamber. This is what you need with those particle accelerators. You need at the moment of impact, you need that to occur in a chamber that's going to leave tracks. So we're going to do one quick question here. Assume that the tracks shown were made by particles traveling at 10% the speed of light through a magnetic field of 30 millitesla. The initial radius of each track is 5.7. The particles start here. Question for you. Why is there no evidence of the particles before that point? One of the particles goes this way. One of the particles goes that way. Why is there no evidence of the particles before that point in time? Any ideas? Ian? Is this a neutron? It does not have a charge, but then when it's broken up, has charges. It could be. It could be. It could be a nuclear process where you have a neutral particle which somehow decays into two charged particles. By the way, is it clear these two particles are oppositely charged? Because they go in opposite directions. If the magnetic field is out, 
and they're both traveling in this general direction at the moment of creation, they're both traveling in that direction at the moment of creation, then the one that is forced to the right is positive, and in fact, you can see somebody's written positive on here. That doesn't show up. Nature doesn't throw that there. Okay? More likely than not, given that the initial radii are both the same, more likely than not, both of these particles have the same mass but opposite charge. It's most likely pair production. And before pair production, there's a photon, not a proton, a photon, which has no charge. Determine the charge to mass ratio and try to figure out what the particles are. Try to confirm what they are. So from the previous unit in unit two, we can do this. Fm is QVB, F net is MA. You are going to see this on the diploma exam, this equation. This is QVB. Acceleration is centripetal, which is M. That means times V squared over R. And we can rearrange this for Q over M. And I'm going to give you a minute to calculate Q over M. You have to take the velocity of the particle. We're estimating it to be 0.1% the speed of light. Divided by the magnetic field that's given in the question and divided by the radius. You need to use standard units of meters and Tesla. Point seven, one point eight. Let me know when you get it. That's right, you don't need your textbook because I put the question. Do you have the set of questions in your handout? Okay, that's good. Uh, uh, did you calculate, Carly? No, I don't have my own okay. calculator. McKenna, have you got it? It's good. That's what you should get. 1.7 times 10 to the 11. Does it round to 1.7 or 1.8? 1.8. So 1.7 what? No, but is there another number after the 7? 1.75 times 10 to the 11. That's perfect. Now, and that's coulombs per kilogram. That's charge to mass ratio. Now, and this is what you would see on an exam. You, you might just be given this diagram and the information and asked, what are the particles that are created? And how do we do that? Well, we know the charge to mass ratio, so go to your formula sheet. Is it an alpha particle? Take the charge of an alpha particle divided by the mass of an alpha particle. Do you get this number? If you do, then we have an alpha particle being one of the particles. I, I don't think it's even going to be close. Maybe it's a proton. Maybe if you take the charge of a proton and divide by the mass of a proton, that you get this number. I don't think so. That's going to give you not even close. But I think if you check an electron, if you take the charge of an electron divided by the mass of an electron, I believe you get 1.76 ish, times 10 to the 11. And that means that you've identified one of these particles as being an electron and one as being a positron. So now I'm just going to finish off by telling you that this is what nuclear physicists do when they work with these. They do experiments. They get a visual record of what's created. They determine the charge to mass ratio. And then what they do is they look up in a table all of the known charge to mass ratios for every particle that they've ever discovered in the history of physics. 
And if that charge to mass ratio that they found is not there, they've discovered a new particle. And tomorrow we'll talk about all of these particles. Turns out that it's not just electrons, protons, and neutrons. It turns out that there are 12, yeah, we'll say 24 truly fundamental particles in the universe. Proton is not fundamental, neutron is not fundamental, electron is. Those are the common particles, but there are lots of other particles that we'll talk about. Any questions with that final example? Yeah. This is um, the liquid for when that fire is liquid or gas. I, I can't tell by looking at it. And by the way, a cloud chamber or a bubble chamber that we I'm going to show you videos of, the detection methods they're using are probably a lot more complicated than just saying, oh, we got this thing with liquid in it. How does one electron, because that is one electron, or is pos one electron is one positive charge, how does that ionize, one electron ionize the whole? It's got energy. That, that's what it boils down to. Um, It's a little bit, I think it's probably a little more, bit more nuanced than just saying the electron has energy so it keeps colliding into atoms and th popping their electrons off. But that's maybe a good way to think of it. The, the reason why I say it's got to be more nuanced than that is it has to have a charge. A neutron in a bubble chamber or a cloud chamber will not leave evidence of its path because a neutron has no charge. So there's, it has something to do with the charge, but basically it's that maybe think of it this way, the charge on the electron that's going through, that charge is pushing electrons out of atoms in its path. That's, that's an oversimplification, clearly. Well, to me, it's obvious that must be an oversimplification. Will? Uh, for a matter and antimatter particle to be annihilated, do they have to be like the, does it have to be an electron and a cybertron, or can it be electron and Oh, I was always taught, that's a great question. In other words, will an electron and an antiproton annihilate? And I was always taught that pair production and matter-antimatter annihilation is with particles that are the fundamental particle or the particle and its antiparticle. So I'm going to say no, as far as I know. So, you know, if Mr. Way shakes hands with Mr. Anti Way, or whatever you want to call that other thing, it's the protons and the antiprotons that are annihilating, and the electrons and the anti electrons, and the neutrons and the anti neutrons that are annihilating. Yeah. But I don't know, that's an interesting question. If I had a bucket of anti, if I had a bucket of positrons, and I poured in a bunch of protons, would annihilate, I don't know. Um, there are some questions there. These are not questions that are assigned. They're questions that I, you know, I think you can go through and read and, and think about to kind of get your brain going in this direction. Really, as a summary, what you need to know is matter can be changed to energy. Energy can be changed to matter through matter-antimatter annihilation and pair production. And you need to understand that to discover new particles requires smashing things together with a lot of energy in a particle accelerator, and to detect them requires a cloud chamber or a bubble chamber. Everything else is an application of physics that we already learned, whether it's E equals MC squared or FM equals F net. Yes, Annalie. I'm pretty sure your exam when we get back will be on the Tuesday. So we finish tomorrow. We finish tomorrow. 
And this, well, I shouldn't say it won't take long. I always try to scale things back, but it never works. We're going to finish tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be reviewing on Thursday and reviewing the day we get back. And just so everybody knows, uh, before you leave, you will be given all the review materials for this unit, and I will also be giving you review materials for the whole course. Okay, And I would encourage you to, on your Christmas break, relax and unwind, but I would also encourage you to find some time to put in some effort to get ready for that diploma exam. And if you're in Math 30-1, the same thing is going to be true. I'll be giving you all of the review materials by the end of the week. I think your math exam is probably going to be on, I think it's probably going to be on the Wednesday that we get back. Because I know I have binomial theorem here, but it's actually two days and, you know, probably half of this day we'll be finishing the unit and then a little bit of review. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know at this point in the year the idea of having a physics 30 and a math 30 exam both on the same day after we get back, that's a bit of a, chem is on that day too. Yeah, that would be a pretty much a slap in the face, wouldn't it? Be your teachers just getting together. Let's find the sharpest stick possible and let's just poke them. Uh, so with that being said, if your chem is on the Tuesday, your math will be on the Wednesday. Okay. That mean, well, we mean one less day for year review, but that's okay. We can, we can still have time. And I don't mean to minimize the diploma exam, but it is only worth 20%, so uh, it's not as crucial as it could be.